Welcome to SickCast, brought to you by Sick Research Institute, illuminating every path. This episode of the SickCast is from a live webinar that originally aired on October 2nd, 2021. Wagajika Kalsa, Wagajiki Fase. Thank you for joining today's webinar hosted by the Sick Research Institute. My name is Manvinder Kaur. I'll be your moderator today. Uh, this webinar will begin with a 40 minute moderated discussion between myself and our panelists today, after which we will have 40 minutes for QA. Um, from the audience. So please be sure to drop your questions in the chat box as the video mentioned, and be sure to include your name and city. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's panelists. First, we have Anok Singh. Anok Singh is a third year psychiatry resident at UC Davis Medical Center, originally from San Jose, California. He completed his master's in medical degree at Turo University, California. I apologize if I didn't get the city name correct. Uh, his interests include global mental health, diversity and equity within medical education and mental health inequities and disparities within immigrant communities. He is currently working on research exploring intergenerational trauma within the Sikh community. Bhavanjeet Gorchima is a first year UBC family medicine resident training in full scope family practice and hoping to specialize in addictions medicine. She's the co-founder of ASRA, the Punjabi Alcohol Resource, which helps Punjabi families navigate problems with alcohol. She's passionate about understanding the nuances and cultural differences when addressing addiction in racialized communities. And lastly, we have Palvinder Kaur Gill. She is a registered clinical counselor who is currently working full-time with provincial health service authorities as a trauma specialist. She also works part-time with Abbotsford Community Services, focusing on populations involved in domestic violence. She has also worked with critical community health organizations, such as the Crisis Line, numerous addiction centers, the Purpose Society, and Moving Forward Families. She is passionate about mental health and demonstrates sincere dedication to working with communities to improve mental health. Welcome to our panelists. We'll hop right into our conversation today. Um, so when speaking about mental health challenges in sick communities, the, the conversation sometimes seem, seems trapped or it remains in these spaces um, between shame and stigma and cultural deficiencies. So today we'll be exploring and thinking about what strengths do sick communities possess in overcoming these challenges? What does a problem with alcohol look like in sick communities? Um, and answering such questions isn't simply to focus on the positive or on the negative, but we're hoping to deconstruct and nuance and contextualize all of these really complex, um, these complex spaces which, within which sick communities live. Um, so we're thinking about why someone or communities might struggle with some ch with such challenges. Something that we're not going to do, do today is make any affirmative statements on what Sikhi says about alcohol. We're not going to delve into the Guru Granth Sahib and share what that says about alcohol. Um, but I think we'll remain in the space where we explore what problems with alcohol look like in the lived experiences of the communities. Um, so we're hoping that this will be a starting point for this conversation and we hope to build on it. Um, we're joined today by our three lovely panelists who I've already had the privilege of introducing. Um, so we'll be drawing on personal and professional experiences to engage in today's conversation. So what do problems with alcohol look like in the communities, as I mentioned? Why do they occur? What are some common challenges that folks might face? And today we have folks from the United States and Canada, so we'll be getting a little bit of a fuller picture. Um, everyone is a healthcare professional, so I think that's a fantastic and helpful lens to be able to look at this, um, to, be look, to look at this challenge through. Um, and we're hoping to end off thinking about how we can harness hope and empathy and Sikhi when we or a loved one is struggling. So to start today's conversation off, I'll start with Bhavanji. Um, maybe to ground us in today's conversation, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about what a problem with alcohol is. Yeah, thank you, Maninder. It's um, really great to be here this morning and have this conversation that's 
much needed in our community. So um, my question, I guess, we're starting off with is like, what is a problem with alcohol? Because, you know, many people drink alcohol and not every single person who drinks has a problem or needs help or needs to further kind of um, investigate what their relationship with alcohol is. But sometimes people do need to do that. So I think when we think of alcohol, there's a continuum of like, um, you know, responsible use of alcohol or safe use of alcohol. Then it can progress into risky behaviors with alcohol. Then it can progress into problems with alcohol and then eventually also end up in like an alcohol use disorder or something that really um, functionally impacts your life. So briefly talking about that, like, kind of safe drinking, safe alcohol use is usually what in our, I don't necessarily love these guidelines, but you know, like Canada, for example, has like safe drinking alcohol guidelines where it like suggests how many drinks a week, like a man, a man and a woman can drink that's safe for their health. Um, I know in our communities that often doesn't mean much, but you know, when you look at the bigger scope of things, that's what we think of. Like if you drink, I think it's 15 for men and 10 for women in a week, like it's a safe amount of alcohol to consume that it doesn't um, you know, the health effects are low, the effects on your social life are low. Um, and then you get into a space where you have risky drinking behavior. So you're kind of drinking outside of that range. Um, and that's starting to cause some issues with your health, might be causing this or, or it could potentially cause issues with your health or your families and the communities you're in. Um, and then after risky, you go to problem drinking. So this is when you start to have problems, like you face the law or you have um, issues with your relationships and with your, sorry, with your loved ones and your family members, or you're going into the ER for blacking out or um, symptoms like that. So that you are clearly kind of seeing that you have a problem with your alcohol consumption. Um, and then all the way to the end where you have an alcohol use disorder, where you really, um, I won't go through all of the guidelines specifically for that, but it basically means that you have a dependence on alcohol. You develop, develop a tolerance to it. Um, you need to drink more and more alcohol. It's out of your control how much you drink. Um, and you, you can have withdrawal symptoms, meaning you physically feel the feel the effects of not drinking alcohol. It's really functioning your day-to-day living. So there's really a spectrum of when we talk about alcohol. Um, yeah, a spectrum of how it affects you. And I think it's important to recognize that not every single person who drinks alcohol is at the end of the spectrum or the beginning of the spectrum, but we need to recognize where they are in that spectrum and what that means for um, any types of supports and help they may need. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's really important moving from the no use all the way to the dependence or the alcohol use disorder. I think something I learned um, from you that was really important was that biological switch that happens um, where there is like a physical dependence and a need to drink alcohol. Mm-hmm. Um, so thinking about what kind of, what kind of supports um, and education might be needed around that, but that's something we can hop back into. Um, I'll throw it to Anok next. I'm wondering what do alcohol, what do problems with alcohol specifically look like in our communities? And I'm not saying that they look different than they do in the wider, in like the larger context, but I'm wondering how you have seen it maybe manifesting um, within Sikh communities or within Punjabi communities, and maybe what are some signs that someone might be struggling? Yeah, for sure. That's a great question. I think just like uh, Pavanjit Benji was saying that, you know, it exists on a spectrum as well within our community too. And oftentimes we silo uh, the type of use within our community into like one way, which is for, like typically like Punjabi people are very destructive when they drink alcohol and they typically over drink and they develop like dependency issues. And it's like a, a very big issue within our community in that regard. But then we also kind of neglect that there's people that lie on the spectrum, you know, that can socially drink and not develop like bad patterns and stuff like that. I will say that one of the big issues that we have within our community is kind of what uh, Abhijit was talking about with like, what are limits of like healthy drinking? And so within the United States, we say, you know, uh, seven drinks a week for uh, women and 14 drinks a week for men. But like, what is a drink? Uh, within our community, we don't really have those types of like, oh yeah, I drink an ounce of brandy or I drink an ounce of whiskey, whiskey, because that's a drink, one ounce of like hard liquor, you know, or um, how do we kind of standardize that? We don't like people just pour it into a glass, mix it with a drink. You have a mixed drink, you're drinking it, you're not really sure. And so I think oftentimes what we 
you see a lot within our community is binge drinking. And it may not necessarily be something that's very noticeable for people because they don't have those standards set on like what is a drink. And so people will actually make one drink and have like three or four drinks in that drink. And be like, oh, I only drank four drinks today, but it was really 12, you know, within a day or something like that. And that happens very often, you know, um, that prototypical, prototypical scene where you're at a event and the uncles are all sitting around the table. And next thing you know, five people drank a whole entire bottle of like hard liquor, you know, and that's totally normal. And some of these people have developed such a dependency that they're the same functional, that they're driving after an event or, you know, just like going about their day. So I would say within the adult community, within our younger community too, especially like 20s to like 30s too, that binge drinking is also very common. Um, you definitely, within our community too, though, like straight up like alcohol dependence where people need alcohol or else they go into physiological withdrawal. Um, and then you do also see on the other spectrum that there's some social drinking that people have been able to like incorporate alcohol within to their lives where it's not impacting them. You know, they're able to kind of socially utilize it as a tool for whatever kind of things that fit into their lifestyle. So yeah, the spectrum exists. I would say the the most harmful though that we see in our community right now, at least from my experience, is like binge drinking for sure. Mm-hmm. I think in my experience, the binge drinking sometimes gets overlooked, both because it's normalized, not within just within our communities, but in like the wider North mm-hmm. American kind of Western um, context. Like it's normal yeah. for college students to drink um, in Canada, in the United States, and UK, and I'm sure in many other spaces as well. But it becomes very like this is just what we do um, in both contexts. And I think um, also something I'm noticing is this difference between a problem with alcohol versus an addiction. So it doesn't I don't think that problem with alcohol is necessarily always unpacked because I think we think we know what an addiction looks like. It's like, okay, this is a physical dependency. It's something you need. You wake up, you drink it, you go to bed. You just need it 24 seven. And that's kind of how we've um that's how we've understood what an addiction or someone who we might call an alcoholic looks like. Um, but then there's like the spectrum that we've been talking about where a problem with alcohol also exists, which can quickly flip to a addiction. So I think that's kind of what I'm hearing you teasing out a little bit is that that normalization of the binge drinking culture. And also it's not, yeah, something that's just in Punjabi community or just in sick communities. And what I think our conversation focuses on is maybe like a little bit of historicizing and contextualizing and thinking about um, what it does look like sometimes specifically for our communities, which kind of brings me to my next question, Pavinder Ji. Mm-hmm. Um, so why do you think that folks in our community uh, struggle with alcohol? Um, you know, um, exactly. I think uh, addiction, we, we understand it, but we really like um, culturally, we don't understand. So first of all, like, you know, if you, if you really look like underneath, like what makes somebody drink alcohol, like what makes somebody drink something that's not good for their health, you know, like, you know, like what really, what sort of like, what kind of psyche uh, sort of uh, makes that and, and results in those behaviors. So if you, you know, if you like look at like really a root cause of it, it's actually a numbing uh like you know something that they use to numb their pain and especially men because we know culturally and i think you know our culture is a just bit behind but like now with other cultures more men are coming out with mental health they're you know asking for help but for us there's still a long road to go uh most men you know they have had trauma which most of our culturally people you know culture you know they grew up in those countries so they've had trauma and you know they were raised by people who were really unconscious of any like you know uh, what mental health is and how uh, like a child development is so you know really it's like a lot of trauma and how do you deal with that you know like how do you deal with it and you deal with it by drinking alcohol you know uh, you know consuming alcohol because you know when I work with clients and I would ask them like what does it do you know and you know so they would say some things like it makes me go to sleep it relaxes me you know uh, it makes me uh, take a, it makes me forget my stress 
you know? So then the question we really have to ask is where is the stress and maybe the, the, how they deal with stress is dysfunction, you know? And their attempt, their intention isn't wrong. They want to get rid of that pain. They want to get rid of that mental pain, but their, uh, their means of, uh, you know, using it to get rid of it is obviously destructive and abuse. So we really have to look at it resolving underneath trauma that exists for most of, uh, I mean, you know, for like in our culture, because there wasn't aware about child development and, you know, uh, so uh, the, underneath is just a trauma that, you know, they're, they're trying to cope with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think what you brought up that's sticking out for me is that perhaps folks aren't inherently backwards or inherently bad. It's not something they're born mm-hmm. with. They're not choosing to be um, someone who struggles with alcohol. They're not choosing to be an alcoholic. It's because of their outside surroundings, because of what they've encountered, uh, maybe, yeah, some resources that they haven't been able to Mm -hmm. access. And I think, um, yeah, what you shared was that maybe drinking alcohol is the best coping strategy that they know. Maybe it's what they saw growing up or Mm -hmm. maybe it's what Mm -hmm. they've seen in media or what's like normalized in their surroundings. So Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's not that they have chosen to have a problem with alcohol or that they're a bad person. It's that like, maybe some bad things happen to them and they, they, they think that alcohol is the best way to maybe cope with that. So like mm-hmm. what I see in your work and in Oak's work and Bavanjit's work is like maybe finding different coping strategies to mm-hmm. help and address mm-hmm. traumas. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I would welcome other folks, other panelists to jump in if there's anything they want to share. Um, so yes, please do so if, if you want to. Um, Bavanjit, maybe I'll switch to you. And I'm wondering, and maybe I've shared a little bit about some misconceptions, but I'm wondering what misconceptions you've come across about those who do struggle with alcohol. I think this flows really well with what Belinda just talked about. Like, um, it, I really, um, I'm thankful you brought up that point because oftentimes when I, when I think about that, so what are the misconceptions about people who drink alcohol? What do we not understand about them? Oftentimes I think about the fact that like, it's not a choice that when somebody gets to that place or they're so dependent on alcohol, it's such a big part of their life. Um, it's very hard to navigate that as family and friends and to see someone do that. And oftentimes there's a lot of anger and resentment and you keep saying, why do you do this? Like you understand it's bad and and you keep feeling like this is a choice this person is making. And obviously it's very complex, like the journey of um, recovery and like your relationship with, with alcohol is quite complex. And some part mm-hmm. of it may be some choices, but oftentimes there's lots of, underlying reasons why people are drinking and I think Lorinda really well highlighted that this is a huge huge misconception like why did this person start to drink like this was it their trauma was it their depression was it their anxiety like what has drove them to have this um you know if it's gone all the way to the addiction or a problem with alcohol and I and so I also like to speak about like the biology of all of this you know like at a certain point, you literally, physically, your body has developed receptors that are dependent on this substance. And that person, it is quite difficult for that person not to have this substance in their body. And so even when they mentally may choose to say that they you know, want to stop drinking or work on their drinking, it's really difficult for them to manage what that looks like um, because of that physical, that physical dependence that's built in their body. So um, I would say these misconceptions around drinking are 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 multifactorial, but like really understanding that oftentimes when you see someone with a problem, there is an underlying reason they've gotten to the point that they have a problem and it could be biological, it could be mental health. Um, but really seeing that this is not a choice. Nobody wants to have their life in this place where they, they're dependent on this substance on alcohol. Um, and it can be quite difficult to do that, but I think it's important to recognize that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's really moving beyond that binary of like good or bad Mm -hmm. Um, and like finding, yeah, yeah, I don't know what like the middle ground of good or bad is. I feel like everything in our lives is so binary. So I'm, yeah, just kind of, this isn't good. This isn't bad. This is just what it is. And it's like much more complex than like, this is a good thing. People who like drink no alcohol are good people. People who drink tons of alcohol are bad people. But it's like, Mm -hmm. it's actually neither of those. And it's like so much more complex. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, thank you for teasing that out. Um, I guess it would be 
it would make sense for us to invoke Saki a little bit here. Um, I'm wondering, maybe Anouk, we'll start with you. What role do you see Saki playing for your patients um, in their understandings of their relationship with alcohol, if at all? I'm wondering, yeah, if, yeah, what what role does, El- does Saki play for them? Um, both, I guess, people who are struggling with alcohol and those who are impacted, something about family members. Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I think that it also depends on the spectrum of Sikhi as well, because Sikhi exists on that spectrum and what importance it plays within somebody's life is is really different. I would say that most people, when they contextualize what drinking looks like through a Sikh perspective, it's kind of what you were saying, where it's automatically labeled as bad. And there's no kind of middle ground between that kind of imagery that it's just bad. It's been stated it's bad. If you want to be a good stick, you don't drink, you know. And I, I do think that on a greater level, those kind of labels are very harmful within our like perception of what we believe is like spiritual, religious, holy, and those kind of things. And most people who have even a limited understanding of Sikhi have that kind of like ingrained into their head, you know, and it creates this distinction between like, what Sikhi can provide in terms of healing and services for people because that stigma is uh, essentially a, uh, becomes a barrier for people to even want to explore that route for like healing and recovery because a lot of people already feel judged by some good. Oh, if I come and present my problem, people will begin talking about me. I can't do it in a public space like this. And then within their own home sometimes that again is evoked like, Oh, like this is not within Gurma or like you need to actually do more part or you need to uh, ask for forgiveness from the Guru because you're doing these sorts of things. Um, and I, I really do think as a community, we need to start coming together to um, have these conversations where we kind of leave that in the past. You know, myself as someone who outwardly at least uh, plays the part of the sick, uh, you know, my own perceptions of what was right or wrong also influenced the way that I looked at uh, my patients who drink um, or even family or friends who drink, you know, and I, I had to get rid of that really quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think going forward, we need to start kind of incorporating ways that we can uh you know, like respect the integrity of Sikhi for what it is, but also realize that on the path in Sikhi that everybody's journey starts differently. And Guru Sahib never excluded any sort of human individual, no matter what path they were on. They walked with literally any type of person that had inhabited the earth. And we have to really kind of take that mindset with us that everybody is Guru Sikh you know, and we have to treat them as such and give them that opportunity to receive that love, you know, and get rid of that stigma. Mm-hmm. And even, yeah, I think presenting, if someone does want to find healing through Sikhi, presenting it as an option. And it's not, it's not, I feel like sometimes it's, um, Sikhi is only available to a certain person. Um, someone who is who we maybe consider like a good person and I could be completely wrong I'm sure some folks believe that Sikhi is available for everyone um, I think in my understanding of what the dominant discourse or what the dominant understanding of Sikhi is is that it's only available for certain people so I think yeah and what you've shared it seems like if someone wants to gravitate towards Sikhi as something that could be healing it's it should be available to them yeah. or it could yeah something that could be or it's like that it's a correction you know like sometimes it's presented that way, like, oh, the sick key is the correction mm-hmm. to for your behavior, right? Like you've been misguided, you're on a bad path, sick key is gonna bring you back onto this path because you've been sinning, because you've been doing immoral deeds, right? And the, I feel like the minute you present any sort of option like that to someone who's struggling with something that already has so much stigma and shame, you know, because internally, even though the culture within Punjabi, I would say, is like you know, like we drink alcohol, we party, we have a good time, you know, there's still a lot of stigma underneath all of that kind of like happy, jolly kind of drinking behavior, because Mm -hmm. no matter what, the the sick influence within Punjab is, is what it is, you know. And so we have to really get past this kind of thing where we're presenting Sikhi as some sort of corrective behavior to 
like bad behavior. We have to really present Sikhi as a way for no matter what path or like what stage of contemplation you are in terms of if you even want to stop drinking, you still have that option as Sikhi as a place for you to go, as a place that you get support no matter what behaviors you're presenting with, you know? Mm-hmm. Can I add into this conversation? I think, yeah, like it, it, um, as I'm hearing us talk about this, like it's just like two perspectives, like religion or Sikhi as a punishment and religion and Sikhi as a source of strength. Like mm-hmm. we got to look at it from a source of strength. And um, when I originally kind of thought about this question, I was like, okay, what role does Sikhi play in like the relationship with alcohol? Like, of course it gives so much stigma, but we also can look at it from the perspective of like, I thought back to like, um, the indigenous folk, the Aboriginal folk, like there are a lot of studies that have been done, um, you know, that there's a lot of uh, mental health and addiction in that community, but connecting with their traditional backgrounds and practices and circles really helps with their recovery. And um, I think in similar ways, like when people have communities and um, whether it's spiritual or something else, it really helps with that journey of strength, finding strength somewhere to continue forward and um, that spirit of hope. And so we need to look at the key from that perspective, that it's a strength. It's something we can look to to um, show us love and compassion versus it's the thing that punishes us and if we and we sin and we're bad. Um, and if we can flip that, I think it has so much power to help if people want that power and want that root. Um, but we need to make that, yeah, make that a more safe space than it is currently. Mm-hmm. 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 And I'm thinking... Yeah, I guess I'm trying to bring empathy towards everyone in these situations. Because when someone, like a family member is like, okay, just do more bot, that totally makes sense. I feel like they're at a loss for what to do, like what what treatment or what healing is available. So what they know is sicky. So of course, that's what they're going to suggest. They're also in a position where they're struggling to help this person that they love. So it also makes sense that they would be like, this is the only this is the only healing I know. Um, and this is maybe the way I know how to apply it. So just having, yeah, like more, yeah, more nuanced conver- or like not nuanced, but like more well-rounded conversations about how we can empathetically help each other, I think is really helpful. And like, yeah, seeing Sikhi as a strength, that's such a beautiful way of putting it. Um, mm-hmm. I'm definitely relating to that. I'm wondering, Bolerji, did you want to add anything? Um, yes. You know, uh, I think uh, just the way our culture, I mean, I'll I'll speak a little bit more about the culture aspect of it is that, um, you know, we're a product of a culture, you know, and if somebody comes to you and says, I'm diabetic, you know, and if some other person comes to you and says, you know, I have addictions, where does our empathy goes towards somebody who's diabetic? Because we don't think addiction is a, is an illness. It's by choice, you know, it's uh, so the culturally. So, until and unless we, as a culture, you know, we, there's a revolution around it, you know, that we, if someone doesn't drink, like, how do we, so I always, you know, say that, you know, when someone has addictions, they're not bad people, they're just sad people. Like, you know, like I worked in prisons, I work in jails. I mean, that, that place is full of sad people, sad and, uh, you know, really uh, uh, people that were hurt, you know. So if we have that perspective that they're not bad people, but they're sad and the day as a culture, as a community, we think of it as a, you know, if someone can, you know, say out loud that I'm diabetic or I have cancer and, and, and we can put that you know, equally with somebody who would say, you know, I have depression, I have a mental health, I have addiction, and we can equally help people, like we don't discriminate between those two. Now is the day that, you know, of course, like, you know, like, you know, Babanjit and Anok said that Sikhi can obviously become a strength. But right now, the way it's used in our culture, remember not religion, but culture. Culture is a, you know, set of norms that, you know, people follow. So, the you know, right now and culturally, we were saying like, you know, this is bad. You're not a good Sikh, you're a bad Sikh. But instead really saying that what is underneath that behavior? You know, and Sikh is an education. I mean, you can't really, you can't, you know, I mean, you I mean, you can't really hate it and walk towards it. You know, uh, you have to feel that this is a healing path for me and to to go for it. So I think, uh, you yeah, know, as culturally, we really need to switch that perspective and go from a, you know, bad to a sad, you know. Just, I mean, we just, we just are more inclined to help people when we look at it from that perspective. Because if mm-hmm. someone's bad, I want to be away from them. I don't want to be with them. 
you know, but if someone's sad, I want to, I want to be there for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, I've never, um, I've never thought about it that way. So I think that's such an interesting thing to think about. I think even, um, I think something I think about a lot is how we think we define and understand culture kind of in this vacuum where it is like, this is everything that fits into the box of Punjabi culture, but Mm -hmm. it's so different for everyone who identifies as Punjabi. Like Punjabi culture for me is different than what it is for everyone on this panel. And I think we sometimes forget that it's actually touched and influenced by powerful entities. So Mm -hmm. I think we forget about how colonialism impacts and I think benefits from um, racialized communities and here specific the Punjabi people, how colonization benefits from us continuously thinking that we're backwards when this is a label that has been applied to us. Um, it's not that we are inherently backwards, that it's not something we're born with. We're not inherently a culture that drinks a lot of alcohol, but thinking about the ways in which history has history and politics and powerful people, even within like Sikh communities. So thinking about power within Sikh communities and within um, Punjabi communities, how they've kind of shaped and impacted why problems with alcohol might exist. So thinking, yeah, not just largely around like British colonialism, but thinking even within um, like caste dynamics, uh, how powerful and not, I'm not talking about like, um, like powerful as in like the ruling class or anything like that. But within, I think the Punjabi context, there's the caste system. And I think oftentimes Jut Punjabis do get to define what Punjabi culture looks like and what it is. And that's kind of what the narrative becomes. And I think that also erases a lot of um, other experiences. So yes, culture is something that uh, influences why we might have problems with alcohol. But I think sometimes uh, we forget that it's not like the one thing we can use uh, as like the reason for why a problem with alcohol exists. So that's, yeah, also what I'm reflecting on. I had um, just a, a, to hop back onto, I think what Babanjit was sharing in a little bit about Fulminder, what you had shared around punishment. Um, I'm wondering why do we always tend towards punishment and is it helpful? In your experience, I know I'm particularly interested in your work with the uh, MCFD, so that's the Ministry of Children and Family Development. Um, You don't specifically have to touch upon that, but um, that was what I was interested in um, around this idea of punishment. Is it helpful? Is it not helpful? I'm wondering if you'd like to share a little bit about that. You know, it's very quick and it's very effective in the moment. And as culturally, generational after generational, what is the fastest way to change somebody? Like, what is the fastest way? And we obviously want to fast. We don't, I, you know, when I work with parents and I say, you know, if, if if your child is angry and if your child is having a behavior and they'd be like, well, no, you know, the way you're telling us, that would take us like another, like five months to, inc-. and I said, that's true. Like it would, I mean, it's not a quick, fast method. I, I don't have that. But, you know, if, if, if you punish somebody, it's a quick and a, you know, easy uh, method, but it only works in that moment, but it damages the relationship. So it damages the long-term relationship that you have with that person, or it damages people mentally, the, you know, the, you know, longer time and a lot of people that have addiction that come to me you know they've had teachers that that punish them abuse them you know and they are thinking and it's there they're like you know if if it wasn't for those teachers we wouldn't be where we are like we would we wouldn't have worked harder you know we wouldn't have studied I mean like we normalize it we think it's okay for me to get punished because we don't know any other way to have that treatment you know, and it's sad. It's sad that, you know, they're thinking that the only that thing that motivated or drove them is is punishment is when people being cruel to them as children. Mm-hmm. You know, so, of course, I mean, culturally, that is still a very big part of us. Uh, you know, it's a quick and a easy to go to. And we just want to, you know, uh, get it done with. And then um, obviously we don't think about the long term effect on a mental health. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, punishment, it seems um, it's not, yeah, there's not really an emphasis on like restore restoration or um, yeah, any transformation. It's mostly, I think at large, um, 
like the United States and Canada really likes punishment. That is usually their like go to. Even though there are other options, it seems like that's the route that they like. But to culturally, go. we haven't had any other option. Like that's just how people raised children, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't think you have another option. So even mm -hmm. the parents that are raising today that were raised by somebody who would hit them and punish them, I mean, what is their go-to method? I mean, it's not something that, you know, we're like, we're habitual beings. We just do what was done to us. And it's so unconscious. You, you know, it just happens in the moment. I mean, even for us, like uh, the way we like, you know, uh, the way we form judgments, it's just so embedded in us. Like it is so hard to, uh, you know, to, to separate, um, separate yourself from that culture. It takes, I don't know, I think it's a lifetime work. Like, you know, if I'm ever going to be away from those judgments, even myself, I still have those because I'm still a very big part of this culture, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it's embedded in your nervous system, you know, uh, like, you know, how it's, uh, you know, the the way it uh, you know started to the way it sort of copes with pain so yeah so um there was no other way you go to school you have punishment you are home you have punishment i mean that's just how things were mm -hmm. and maybe shifting a little bit towards um what kind of healing folks gravitate towards or what options actually are available to people no maybe I'll, I'll switch to you i'm wondering what kind of treatment or healing you've seen um, your patients gravitating towards when they do have a problem with alcohol and maybe, yeah, what options are available to people? Yeah. So, I mean, unfortunately, at least within California, we don't really have treatment centers that are centered around like Punjabi folks experiences for sick people and their experiences. So the options are very, very limited, you know, on a, on an individual provider level, you hear that very frequently, like, where am I supposed to go? I, I went to this counselor. They are, they don't understand what it's like to be Punjabi. They don't know what it's like to be sick. I, I try to explain it to them. They want me to do this therapy. How am I supposed to do this therapy with my, my parents and stuff? You know, like, there's a lot of um, programming that still needs to be created for our community right now in order for them to feel like they can engage. Um, and engage in a place where they feel safe, that their stories are valued, that they're not feeling othered. And I think that's a huge problem for most racialized communities is that feeling of not only being pathologized like right away for your behavior, but then on top of that, like your behavior being some sort of like, um, you know, like the worst type of behavior within that spectrum or something, you know, because you're from marginalized community and so yeah i wish i had an answer where i told you that you know in our community we have all of these resources and my patients are we jump to them so quickly and they like right off the bat start getting better but we really don't you know there's a few uh alcoholics anonymous programs that are in punjabi that are actually run out of toronto and so keep, i've told patients sometimes like hey why don't you jump on a a zoom meeting and they're like okay like it's three hours ahead you know there's like all these logistical issues um and then they just don't actually end up having a place to go you know um so right now very limited you know usually it's very much so creating an individual plan with the patient trying to be empathetic trying to see what you can do to support them trying to find some sort of therapist or program that you've heard some good news about a lot of co-opting into like other brown spaces right like um for black and latinx folks sometimes people feel a little bit more comfortable in those spaces but overall we have a lot of work to get to that point where we have those resources mm -hmm. actually i think there is also um an, an aa in bc so I'm happy to connect you to those folks if that would yeah, be helpful. Cool. And actually one in California too. So I'm happy to yeah, share those resources with you. Um, and with other folks, if they want to send us an email, I'm happy to share resources and anything um, that I might be able to share. But I'm wondering, Bob and Jeet or Bo and there, um, yeah, what do re resources look like in British Columbia or Canada at large? Or what are you seeing um, your patients or clients gravitating towards? Like what's been helpful, what's not been helpful? Mm -hmm. 
Um, uh, you know, I, we do have a lot of resources, but it's really a matter of asking for help. You know, it's really a matter of, uh, so that is a bigger roadblock for, you know, uh, you know, in, in BC, because we have a lot of programs, we have a lot of psychoeducation program, domestic and addiction courses that are happening and that are happening. I mean, they're still not, you know, easily accessible, like it would be in a, in a language called English, you know, obviously, I mean, there's still, uh, you know, um, there's still a shortage of that, but there is still, but I, what I find it, I mean, the clients that I get are, are, are mandated by probation officers like they have to attend those you know sessions with me but if it wasn't that they might not some of them might not like 80 percent of them won't it's just because uh, they're mandatory for them so i think culturally asking for help and you ask men to do that that's even a bigger uh roadblock right so and you don't i mean you know if you get hurt i always say if you break a leg you you go to the hospital you don't consult with people you don't think i i mean there's not a question you know, that should you go to the hospital or should you not? But if you have a depression, if you have addiction, if you have a mental health issues, I mean, no, maybe I'll just do it. I'll just be at home and I'll just, you know what I mean? So that access of help and that, you know, and of course, these discussions and having like some online sessions would really like you go into people's houses and you, you know, sort of um, inter uh, you connect through those videos and stuff. But I think the biggest hurdle for people is to reach to access those services. You know, you know, we do. I mean, I work with a lot of organizations where there's free programming, free counseling, you know, whether it's uh, Archway Community Services or like, you know, even within Surrey Urgent Primary Care Center. Like I refer clients to those uh, those places. But like you said, it's still a culture because you have to have a you have to know their culture. You know, uh, they will feel more comfortable. So that could be a biggest hurdle because some of those, uh, you know, uh, programs are taught by people i'll just like quick quickly add in a little bit like i think when i think of um, um supports and treatments and resources people can access a lot of the time it's also important to talk about the breadth of things you can access because i think i'll um specifically talking about alcohol in our community people usually think like this person has a, a problem with alcohol they need to go to rehab like they need to go to an inpatient rehab center and the truth is actually that that's not actually true. Like that's not the only place someone can receive help and sometimes mm -hmm. not even the best place for someone to receive help. And so understanding that there's a spectrum of ways that people can deal with addictions and it goes from like anything like going to your family doctor and, and seeking medication or an mm -hmm. addiction specialist, an outpatient population that can um, support you through your addiction by a medication or support you with group counseling or um, like day daytime programs where you can go home at night like there are other ways to deal with addiction versus just being like rehab the only way and for sure rehab center wise like there are really little even in bc i'd say places where you can go to rehab center where it's like punjabi sick focus where people will understand you the programming programming in punjabi like very very far and few so like that's a very hard thing to access and people don't realize that there are other things you can access before you have you know what I mean? That that might not be the only answer. So mm -hmm. um, I think that, yeah, that's really important. I'm just going to do like a, it's not really a pitch, but like at austernow.ca, which is like a website that we've created, like we try and talk about that. Like what are the ways we can help or what loved ones that we have like a page on that. And then we list all the different ways um, you can get help and the resources that exist um, currently in BC. So like that's like a good place to go if people are thinking and wondering about what are the ways I can help with this issue. So um, yeah, there's that. Awesome. I just threw it in the chat as well. Um, and if folks, I did get a couple of messages of folks asking me for resources. So if you just want to send um, us or an email with your city, um, we can definitely try to direct you to whatever we know. Um, I, I hope that's our email. Um, yeah. So thank you. For, thank you, everyone. I know we have tons of questions as well. So I won't um, take too much longer with me being the one that gets to ask all of the questions. Um, but I'm wondering, um, what are some common roadblocks that all of you are seeing uh, to completing your work? I know some of you shared a little bit about maybe this acceptance piece that folks need to, or I think it's helpful when folks accept they have a problem with alcohol and then they can receive help. But I'm wondering, yeah, what are some um, what are some roadblocks that you're seeing? And maybe even like this scarcity of resources. Uh, we can start with you, Anok. 
Yeah, I think the, one of the biggest issues here, and we were kind of talking about this before the presentation even started, was at least the the difference between like the United States versus Canada, with it being like single payer versus we have our own little whatever the heck you want to call it out here. But uh, um, the resources are really county based, so depending on what county that you live in, uh, that's kind of like what kind of mental health treatment that you can get, especially for people who are uninsured and you know the people that within our community who often have those problems with drinking um tend to be people who are working kind of labor jobs they're not going to have the access to those kinds of um like standardized like hmo ppo types of medical insurance and so every county has a different way of a uh, like addressing their underserved populations and what i've noticed time and time again is there's no real accreditation for like translators you will have people who claim that they speak Punjabi but they're Hindi speaking and there's no one to actually audit oh do you actually speak Punjabi oh yeah I speak Punjabi they'll say a couple words oh okay cool you're a Punjabi uh, translator so a Punjabi person comes in they need a translator and their translator doesn't speak Punjabi they'll literally say it to them oh I can only speak Hindi can you understand Hindi and what are they supposed to say you know they can't convey it to the medical professional that, hey, this person doesn't actually speak my language, you know? So that's a that's a huge issue. Uh, county to county resources, not having that awareness, not having funding. Um, and, and then uh, one of the biggest issues out here, and I think probably globally for a lot of Sikhs is just, we get put into this silo of being South Asian, you know? And South Asian, uh, classification is such a broad classification. It it puts so many different ethnic groups with into this label that is often seen as a very high performing, very high functioning, contributing to like Western society. You know, uh, you have politicians who are South Asian, but like the majority of people who have power and wealth within the South Asian community are like upper caste Hindu Brahmin people. You know, and so. That is a challenge for us. Uh, how do we kind of get our community to be separated from that while also showing solidarity with people within that classification, but saying like, hey, we're distinct. We have different kind of needs and uh, resources uh, that our specific community needs too. So I think globally there there probably should be a push now for Sikhs and Punjabis to start kind of Maybe not necessarily divesting, but really seeing like what that kind of ethnic labeling does in terms of like erasure for Punjabis globally, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point that you bring in, like the the diversity within a group that is often classified as diverse. Um, that yeah, it's like um, maybe teasing apart these like singular identities that we give to larger groups. Um, I'm wondering, Babinjit or Bovinder, if there's anything that you wanted to share around that. Um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, of course, resources is the one. And if you take the, you know, resources, and let's say they have been provided, then another roadblock I have experienced is for men to access their emotions. You know, that is just, you know, they're like, if, you know, if I say like, you know, so this made you angry and then so you were hurt, they'll be like, no, I'm not hurt. I'm just angry. You know, and but we know underneath the hurt is anger, and under I mean, underneath the anger is the hurt, and then obviously there's a fear. Like for them to like access these emotions, and I think you know, culturally, just like women have been at the back end for certain uh, uh, for certain things, but men have also been like mentally they have been deprived of you know uh, to say that I'm at like I'm 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 feeling you know uh, lost I'm feeling confused I'm hurt like my you know I'm having a heart like it's harder for men to say that out loud you know to to process and to have the, you know to express these emotions out loud so I find that's a bigger uh, that that's a you know, quite a big roadblock for them to really access their emotions because culturally, I mean, you know, I, I get clients, they work with me and then they go into the same home that says, boys, don't cry. I mean, if, I mean, you're a man and if you're crying, what's going to happen to the family, you know, and if there's a death of a mom and a, or, 
you know, parent, then you can't cry because obviously everyone in the family is looking up, up to you. I mean, you can't process those. So, like, I, I think as a culture, we have to look at different way of, uh, of, uh, of uh, defining what a man is. Not somebody who doesn't ever express their emotions, not somebody who doesn't ever cry, not somebody who says, who doesn't ever lose. Like we have to change the definition of what man is in our in our culture, and we have to do that as a culture. You know, if I'm a woman, I have to look at like a. If I look at a man, I have to look at it in a different capacity. If I'm a mother, I have to raise a child or a, or a son in a different capacity. Somebody who comfortable in expressing and you know however uh, you however you know the men that you interact in your life you just have to have a different way of defining and uh, defining their their man you know manhood mm-hmm. i'm thinking I, like oh go ahead sorry i'm sorry i was just going to jump on that as like the point that i want to make i think it's kind of hand in hand because um i think i even saw a question about this on the side but um We've done this like needs assessment in our community to ask people like, oh, have you, did you ever go for help if you had someone who's struggling with alcohol? What, um, yes or no and why and why not? And people, you know, 50%, 50% of people said like, no, we never went and got help. And like the number one reason or the biggest barrier they found to getting help was because the person who struggled with the alcohol problem wasn't ready to admit or see that they struggled with a problem with alcohol. And I think like a very, very big part of our barriers in our community is that piece is that when someone struggles with alcohol very often like because of our culture because of how we shape men our 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 relationship with with alcohol like no it's normal that i drink every night no it's normal that i have this many drinks like no i'm still working my job so i don't have a problem with alcohol mm-hmm. oh no my problems with you as my wife are unrelated to my alcohol drinking like there's so much around how we view alcohol as normal and every other thing as not connected and so it's very oftentimes people struggle because they see someone struggling with alcohol but that person themselves cannot see that they're struggling with alcohol and it's because of our culture it's because of what we've been taught it's because of how we read our the relationship we've been raised with with alcohol in our community so um i don't even know the answer to this yet i think it's a really big barrier and i um when i often think about it i'm just like what can we do now like a we may need to a a big part of is accepting if someone's not going to accept they have a problem you cannot make them accept it. And that just kind of destroys you in the process. Like you need to also distinguish yourself. But I think for me, these conversations we're, happen- we're having now is what's going to change that. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe not for the people who've already been affected, but for the generations to come. And I think that's why it's so important that we have these conversations so that we can stop seeing alcohol. Like we can start seeing alcohol for what it is and not just what we created in our community and our culture. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's my like, add on to that and but I feel like it's a huge barrier in our community and just the just the way we train men in our culture Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just the way we raise boys in our culture like that's a like and then conversations like these would help to you know so that we can raise different boys like we can raise them to be you know to cry and to uh you know to fall short off and to have those flaws and be okay with it Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. and I think maybe a group of folks that were that we often don't talk about are women who struggle with problems with alcohol or folks who um, identify differently on the gender spectrum. So I think there's like, there's a different type of shame and a different type of stigma that gets attached to woman drinking. And I think the normative stories that come up are like, oh, girls who like will get their brothers to get them a drink at uh, a reception, at a wedding reception. So it's really done in secret. So I think there's this extra layer of shame and stigma mm-hmm. and this extra barrier or multiple extra barriers to seeking help to accepting that you have a problem because girls don't drink that's not even something that exists in our like in our understanding of who does and doesn't drink and although yes like i i think statistically uh, it's been proven that men perhaps have problems with alcohol more often I think there's a large portion of folks that we aren't reaching because we kind of assume that women don't have problems with alcohol. And if we do, it's just like very small number of women. Um, But in my experience, I think I'm like, oh, I'm someone that's very open about the role alcohol has played in my life. So everyone is really comfortable coming to me and sharing their stories. And if they have a problem, they should definitely be able to like share it with me because I'm so open. 
um, when I'm sharing one-on-one with someone, but I've been in many encounters where it's taken months for someone, someone who identifies as a woman to admit to me that they actually are the one that has the problem. And it's not their family. It's both their family mm. member and themselves. Sorry. I live in the, in the city. So if you hear honking in the background, that's what that is. Um, so I think I'm always, I'm constantly surprised, even though I've been doing this work for a while, but I'm constantly surprised at how how long it takes um, for folks to open up, um, particularly people who are more marginalized, so mm-hmm. you, who live and exist in these more marginalized identities. Um, and my second point was, before we get into questions from, actually I have one last question and then we'll get to the audience. Um, but my second point was around structural factors that impact people being able to access help. So I know Anok Singh and I did, um, we were working on a support group for folks in California with um, the team at Jagara Movement. Um, And something that came up was, um, like we've mentioned, uh, oftentimes Punjabi folks do labor jobs and those jobs include driving a taxi or driving a truck. Um, And sometimes if you have a problem with alcohol, your license might get taken away. Um, so and sometimes healthcare professionals have to, or they think that they have to report um, that this person who drives for a living has a problem with alcohol. And people in the community are aware of that possibility of their licenses mm-hmm. being taken away. Like they're not, they're not stupid. They don't live in a vacuum. They understand if they go to a healthcare professional who adheres to like these larger structural factors that their their livelihood might be taken away. So we're even preventing people who might want help. Uh, And that was something we encountered in our group. There were people who wanted help, but they couldn't get help because it meant that their livelihood would be taken away. So why would you go out and ask for help if you know that the way that you provide for your family is going to be taken away or it even might be? Um, So Mm -hmm. even like these structures and like maybe these rehabs and counselors, um, these we all like adhere to these professional colleges and they dictate what we can and can't do sometimes. So I think... People know that. So why would they trust um, people who work within these systems who might end up reporting them? And Pavan I'm sure you're like familiar with that as you work with work with the MCFD, like reporting children and families happen so often. So why would you why would you ask for help if you're just gonna get punished? Um, was kind of my point. But yeah, thank you everyone so much for sharing. My last question to kind of round out before we head to the audience, which I know I keep saying, um, but is what strengths do sick communities possess in overcoming these? Um, challenges. I know we talked about it a little bit. It came up. How can we harness this hope, empathy, and Sikhi when we or our loved ones are struggling? And uh, maybe a note can start us off. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, go ahead. You can go ahead. Fine. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, the community aspect of like our culture is really strong, like where we like get together. And I think that is I mean, that, I mean, obviously, I mean, it's not what it used to be. Like, you know, now they're saying that there's only like three people in each household. There used to be five and now it's just keeps going down every year. But I think um, within our community, like, you know, if there's a, someone's grieving for somebody, like there's a sense of community. You know, there's sense of people coming together. And I think that's very strong to, you know, to, you know, uh, sort of uh, that 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 works as almost like an antibiotic for mental health to have people who are there to support you. So that's, I think, a a very big strength for our, uh, you know, for our community that that can play really well, uh, you know, when someone is obviously struggling with addictions and having that because underneath that is being lonely and, you know, you know, isolation, uh, you know, so I think that is a bigger strength. Yeah. Yeah, I would go, I would echo off of that too and say that even on a larger scale, our community has shown that when it needs to organize around something that it can definitely pull resources and mm-hmm. put on an event. Like, look, every city that has six probably has some sort of a medla that happens every year, you know, and they're able to pull resources and get community members to come and join you know, um so we've demonstrated that we have the ability to like get resources and when we want to put on sort of project and now it's kind of like utilizing that strength to start using it for programs that really matter within our community mm-hmm. that starts with a, a different conversation i guess with like holding who we put in power accountable for what direction we want our funds and our things like I see a lot of comments in 
uh, the chat about like using the Gordora as a space and like it's so obvious. Why aren't we using the Gordora as a space? That's a huge strength within our community. Mm-hmm. We have spaces within our cities where people know like, oh, that's the Sikh temple. In San Jose, we have the largest uh, Sikh temple in the uh, like North America, right? But why isn't the largest space utilizing it for resources such as community gym, community garden, you know, community library, things like of that nature? Uh, we have to really look at what we utilize the Gurdwara for and what we've created it to become within these Western constructs, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, on so many levels, we can demonstrate that there's six that are successful. There's uh, agencies that we've created amongst, like, the Sikhi that are doing really well. And now it's like, okay, we've done this. We can do this again for mm-hmm. specific issue that we need to. Now it's just doing things like this, you know, now we understand that there's professionals in this area that are motivated to do this, you know, people on the ground that are willing to kind of put in the effort. And so, yeah, I think our organizing is a strength. Now we just have to utilize it in a way that uh, is tackling some of the harder issues. I'm wondering if there's anything you wanted to add. I don't know if there's much more. I think I just echo the sentiment that we have, we come from a, like a, we're lucky that we have a culture and space that comes from a sense of community and coming together and banding together and having that support. Not everyone has that. And so the fact that that's like already ingrained in our culture is like really Mm -hmm. something we need to hone into in terms of like, when we look at addiction and, and the process people go through with that. And I think you, you guys have just made amazing points. Like, um, it's a little bit sad sometimes that as, as like a minority group, we need to kind of advocate for ourselves because otherwise we get lost in this huge system. But, you know, thankfully we do have the resources, like we have a community that would come behind us. And so really using that to our strength. Um, and I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that as we keep having these conversations, this will happen because I see all the comments and, and like we, everyone thought for years that Gordetta that should have more support, but you know, it just hasn't happened. And I'm, I'm just, hopeful that in it as we keep talking about this and realizing this it actually manifests itself Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think there was like or there sometimes is this narrative that folks at gurdwaras are sometimes hard to work with and i think something that we found out is that there are different ways in which you can engage with folks at the gurdwara it doesn't have to be um yeah this one way like we are right you are wrong we are just going to come in with our like modern ideas and like modernize the Gurdwara. There's like a middle ground and a conversation that you can have where Gurdwaras are open to having spaces where there is this conversation um, and you're kind of building into maybe that larger conversation that you want to have. But just opening up a space for conversation even I think is a great starting point. So moving into questions from the audience, um, uh, Nav is asking, how can we bring up this topic to a loved one who's, who is having this issue? but refuses to see that it's a problem and that they're trying to numb the pain, won't, but won't be able to eradicate the issue by simply drinking. So I think this is a question that we get all the time. Um, so how do you kind of help someone who doesn't want help, maybe who hasn't accepted their problem, who maybe isn't seeing kind of all of the other stuff that we're seeing? Um, yeah, Anofa or Bowinder or Babinji, whoever wants to get us started, how have you yeah, how how can you kind of help someone who maybe isn't ready to accept that help? You know, so what you what we really have to tune into is looking at other you know someone's uh, uh, resistance, you know, and there's a reason why there's a resistance. So empathetic, you know, being empathetic towards people's uh, you know uh, resistance. So you know, for example, like if someone is declining the help, you know, I understand that this is you know this is something that you don't want to do, and maybe there's some hurt underneath that, and maybe you know there's some shame or guilt underneath that, and I understand that as a culture like it's harder you know um, when I have people come to me and they said you know I, I say it's hard to admit that I'm a I'm an alcoholic it is so hard I even if I had that problem I wouldn't be able to go out in the community I mean just having that empathy where they're coming from you know so we're culturally conditioned so when you have that empathy you tune into their emotional uh, state you know, rather than, because when your focus is, even as a therapist, I struggled that um, earlier in my uh, my career days is when you're like, focus is we really, really want to change. You forget the relationship. But what really changes people is the relationship. 
not a, you know, of course, therapies and all these have their own part to it. And, you know, have those structures is good to have. But what really changes people uh, uh, is a relationship. And what relationship changes people? A relationship that's providing unconditional acceptance and unconditional compassion. And really, under and there's a lot of empathy. So when people feel safe in a relationship, they will come out of their shell. But it just, it's a matter of a time, you know, when they, for some people, it's easier to come out of that shell. For other people, it's harder, but you don't go at somebody and saying, I'm going to change this person today, or I'm going to change this person in a month or, you know, in like in 10 days, you don't have that agenda. Your agenda should be, I want to have a relationship with this person. And if I have, and if I have a relationship and, you know, that's where the journey starts from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that can be really, really hard for both parties. It's so challenging. It can take so long. It fluctuates. I know everyone talks about like your healing journey isn't linear, but beyond like it being said all the time, it is true. Uh, yeah. It goes up and down. It can change all the time. And I think when you talk, when we talk about it, it's like, just be, just be empathetic and really nice and like accepting. But like actually doing it is such a struggle. So and and it's okay if you fail at it. It's all right. Like you know, there's a. It's called the. I mean, in culturally, we don't talk about it. It's called repairing relationship. You know, it's failing and then starting it again, failing and starting it again. It's like we're not asked to get it hundred percent right for the first time. So don't put yourself in that pressure. It's okay. It's a work. It's a work and a progress and, you know, every day just gives you another opportunity and that's a, that's okay. Some days you'll get it right and other days you won't get it right. And mm-hmm. that's okay too. That's okay too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I no, think that approach, I can mute it, yeah, sorry. That, that approach is like ideally the best approach, you know, but like in practice is so hard to ask yeah. sometimes of, yeah. of people, you know, especially within our community where uh maybe anecdotally like the men are some of the the folks that inevitably like have these drinking issues and then we're putting that onus on our women in our community to not only endure like their behavior through alcohol but then be like hey while you're at it like engage them in an empathetic way while they may be like inflicting trauma onto you you know and so we like burden our like sisters so much within our community to not only like coddle men through their like addiction, but then also repair the relationship and then also work on their mental health so they can be strong enough to like yeah. take, pick this person up and take them like through that process of recovery. And it's so unfair, you know, like within our community, that's the discussion that needs to start being had is like, how can we hold other men to be accountable for those actions, right? Like when a wife is having difficulty with her husband, why isn't the whole family like coalescing around her, creating a barrier for her to be protected? And then then using their empathy to repair the relationship with their son, with their brother, with their uncle, you know, with their cousin, whatever it may be. I think that's where we need to really start like reframing it. That like patriarchy is like so rigid within our community, but oftentimes Mm -hmm. just always ends up falling on the wife has to deal with this abuse. The daughter has to deal with her dad doing all this stuff. The son ends up going to college and forgets about what's going on at home, whatever the case may be, you know? So the those discussions, we really need to start having it and start breaking it down. It's not going to happen like just with one webinar or anything, but slowly, slowly, we need to start breaking those kind of shackles of patriarchy. And, uh, you know, just to add a point to, uh, know, you know, as women, we feel like we have to do it all. Like we have to like, you know, we're like, we have to take care of the house. We have to take care of the children. We have to, I think asking for help and, you know, you're not going to be able to do it alone. Because you're going to, I mean, if you're dealing with somebody who's alcoholic, you're going to run out of your own mental resources as well at some point. You know, it's just a matter of a time. So you have to make sure that there's somebody out there that's supporting you too, that's providing that support for you. That there's people there for you while you're being there for other people. I'm just going to add in. Sorry, go ahead. Well, more so if you're dealing with somebody who's in addiction, of course. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, I think these are great points. I know, especially like making that point of the onus being put on one person to like help someone through this process is, is, 
it's like not, it's not possible. Like it, mm-hmm. it, it will break someone down. And I think um, this just reminds me of this concept of, I mean, I've chatted about it before in different kind of um, seminars, but um, the, sh- in Punjabi culture, when we have, a, when someone has a problem with alcohol, it's so hush hush. Like we can't let anybody know that your dad or, you know, or my husband is an dress uh, goes with alcohol or is abusive. Like we just don't want anybody to know, but it's really ironic because everybody is struggling with it. Like mm-hmm. every other household you hear about, every other person you hear about has that person in their life that's struggling. And so why is it that we feel the need to cover it up when everyone is having this problem? Um, and if we can just start to break that stigma, that if we, that we can talk about it and the chances are there's some people who can relate to you and that's, what's going to help us actually create places where it's not just the wife who's helping. There's an understanding mm-hmm. that the chacha, the thaya, the whoever else is a part of your family is also responsible for this person and dealing with this problem. And it's not just this one person. So, um, yeah, it just brings me back to that. We do this in our culture, especially about this topic. And we need to stop because that's how we're going to actually create support systems that are sustainable um, that can help someone through this. Thank you, everyone. I love how, yeah, I love the the back and forth. I love, yeah, how, how passionate everyone is about sharing today and all of the questions we're getting. I swear we never get this many questions. Um, kind of building off of these like multiple traumas, traumas from different from different part with from different fa- parts of the family, from different family units. Um, someone has asked a question all around uh, along these lines. Um, so what I guess, yeah, in talking about trauma, uh, maybe invoking this even like the word trauma can be taboo. Um, the topic might get ignored, or people might act as if um it's not something that's okay to bring up so what are some ways that we can maybe start talking about trauma in a subtle way and then eventually maybe progressing is what this person asks um they feel as though our community is so worried about what others think of them uh, that they don't even want to look at themselves because of that fear and that fear is totally valid um yeah so how can we start having conversations um around trauma maybe even in subtle small ways whoever wants to start that would be okay with me even um, unpacking, I guess, a little bit. Go ahead, go ahead, ahead, ahead. Go ahead. I'm just going to start. I feel like you'll have a lot more to say about this. Blender, so I'm just going to say like a really small tidbit, um, <laughs> which is <laughs> some, something I think about sometimes is the way in which we give people information, active versus passive. And I think, you know, sometimes when you're active, like you're speaking to someone and saying like, I think you have this trauma and I think you need to work through this can be very hard for someone to accept and like actually even want to talk about or think about. But if you give it to them in a passive way, like, oh, I heard about this topic or someone else was talking about this. And it's not about that person, but it starts to get them to think about this is sometimes a um, a way to start broaching topics. And so when I think about this concept, a lot of the times I think things like when we have conversations on radios and places where people don't have to feel like they're the subject of what's happening, but they can still learn about a concept and hear about it really helps our community start to potentially think that they might have that issue and th- and talk about it. So for me, I do often think about that, like active versus passive information. How can we passively bring this to our community before we make them actively accept it um, can be a way that we start tra- talking about this. Yeah, I agree. I think within our community, we actually have an overexposure to trauma, which then makes it harder to speak about our own personal traumas. From a sick perspective, good, like, Growing up, even if you don't know like all of Sikh history, you know that there's so much struggle involved with even just keeping the dharma alive. You know, like you hear about shahidi from like an early oh the char shabd they like chote shabd they went in front of like Wazir Khan and said like we're gonna we'd rather sacrifice our life. You know, so things of like war, death, that kind of stuff that happened within our people's history is like something that's very commonly talked about you go into some gurdwaras and you see pretty graphic images of like by Singh getting his head scalped you know so like we were like we've really been exposed to very traumatic things from like early on and then we kind of like even get into like more recent sick history where then it's like partition happens our grandparents are literally forced to migrate to new places and that's one more trauma that happened. And then the the 50s happened, Punjabi Soba movement, like Gadri Babe. Then you have the 80s with Jirasi and all the things that happened afterwards. So like these big traumatic events keep happening and we 
we talk about it and because within Sikhi, it's like, you know, we're always in Chardikula, like these things, they, they make us proud. It's part of our culture. It's part of our identity. And then when personal trauma happens, like, oh, how can I talk about this when these things have happened to my people, you know? And I think that we now have to like start really kind of like, I don't, I wouldn't say like distancing ourselves, but like uh, making a distinction between like what historical trauma is and then what personal trauma is and that it's okay to be able to like express those personal traumas without fear of like some sort of retribution that I'm weaker in terms of like where I place myself within Sikh history or what a what a Punjabi man or even women within the culture and stuff too. So yeah, the overburdening of trauma and then now making it comfortable to speak about our personal traumas is I think that um is a way that we kind of got to move forward. And, you know, trauma is, is it's a really like a wound, you know, you can't have somebody touch it without, you like, you know, if someone is not, you don't have a relationship with, you know. Um, so, you know, if you have a relationship and Bhavanjit made a point to, uh, you know, just giving out information while people just sort of, you know, look at their own wounds and not let anybody touch it because you can't really touch it. it it's a painful experience. You know, but it's just less painful if somebody who you have in a relationship and you know you're safe and this person is taking care of you, it is less painful. You know, you have that safety. So just having those two, you know, make sure that you have a relationship with that person before you sort of, you know, touch on those those topics with them one on one. But just giving education where they don't have to be on the spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm thinking about, I guess, something recently that I've been thinking a lot about um, is when we want the people in our lives that we love to get help, what that would even look like and mean for them to go to a therapist, to go speak to a counselor, and to unpack those traumas that they have been suppressing and drinking to not think about for like 40, 50 years. Like, what would that mean for them mm. to finally address them mm -hmm. and are you actually able to support that person as they address these things that they have been suppressing for like 40 50 years yeah uh, and what would like radical acceptance around them maybe not getting help look like if that's not mm -hmm. something that they want to do um, and that can be really really hard and you might have to go through like a grieving process yourself so I think ultimately I do hear all of our panelists sharing that there's there's yeah a lot to unpack a lot to struggle and deal with um, I guess we have one question or two more questions that I might meld into one because we haven't gotten to talking about my favorite thing, which is harm reduction. Um, but so it's kind of two questions and I'll let anyone here who wants to answer them. Um, but how can we address drinking in our youth? Maybe what are some strategies um, we can use to uh, engage with youth? And then um, the second question was what are, what other substance or substances or intangible determinants to our community's health can be addressed? Uh, by a harm reduction approach. So maybe, yeah, I guess the two questions are, how do we uh, talk to youth uh, about drinking? Um, and then what role could harm reduction play in that? If any. I think this person kind of mentions it in their, in their um, question, but this reminder that the youth have learned their relationship with alcohol from their parents, from the older people that have already exposed them to what a relation with alcohol looks like. So we really need to, I would, I, don't, I guess like my answer is like education. Like we need to be like, show our youth that, Hey, alcohol can be used in the, in these types of ways. And this is the way it's unhealthy. And this is the way in which it could be healthy. And this is the way that our community has a bad relationship with alcohol. Like if we start to show them and talk to them about that like that is what will switch that relationship with alcohol but it's difficult because if your parent does it it's hard for you not to learn what your parent does so um yeah I think for me it's just it was honestly really revelatory. like for me when I first realized this fact that like I remember like thinking like wow like people in my own age group really struggle with alcohol and then I reflected and were like oh they're just emulating what their parents did at parties like they're doing the exact same thing and like even that realization was so important to like, you know, not blame them and understand why they're doing what they're doing and seeing like how you could reframe it for them. So, um, yeah, I think that's like my thoughts around that. 
And also having an emotional support around youth as well, you know, uh, uh, would be benefit. So, you know, you you're making sure that there's an emotional uh, support that's around maybe it's coming from a family and maybe um, that's a therapy form of therapy or some other resources in school or in in community because um, I mean it's a it's a time of a roller coaster emotions you know like it's it's a lot of emotions that it's a lot of uh, you know life changing things that are happening so to be able to navigate yourself through that emotional roller coaster you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there is going to be a need of an emotional support there. And someone yeah. who understands the emotions underneath that behavior, then yeah. just making it a good, good versus a bad. Yeah, in addressing both of those questions, I think the first question about harm reduction for alcohol, I mean, there's definitely been studies about like using a harm reduction approach with with alcohol. It's not like what you typically expect with other programs where like heroin you have like clean needle exchanges and stuff like that but like in households where like violence is very common secondary to like alcohol use there's like special glassware that i know people can buy that like it doesn't shatter in the in a certain way so like you can avoid like physical injury there's like even ways that people have come up with like arranging furniture and stuff like that so like furniture that's special padded and stuff because oftentimes with violence like things like that happen people get pushed into things so there are like methods with that even controlled drinking you know where like you bring in programs where you don't tell people like you need to stop it's like hey we're gonna like be a part of this controlled drinking program like you like uh, glasses that have like labels on them that like show like hey this is an ounce of a drink so that people start bring like building awareness like oh this is actually the amount i'm drinking when i drink you know so um things like that are definitely something that can be implemented within those spaces as well in terms of youth i mean we have to have these conversations early and often you know and it starts at a very very um like local level within the cordori and stuff if people are going to like call to school and that kind of stuff we start we have to start having those conversations now um uh within our like system as well uh, within uh, uh California uh education is a huge component and so uh, i saw that sarah says that she's part of jakarta and i know jakarta is doing that uh, program for that example for that basically that reason you know like building peer support within uh kids so that they have people that they can feel like are their own age you know and that they can rely on and then building it within our education system so that curriculum is culturally based too right because you've had heard programs like dare like how many people had a dare shirt like going through um elementary school and how many of them thought it was like a huge joke you know like just telling people don't ever drink in your life avoid every single drug it's just not realistic you know we can't tell our youth like don't ever drink in your life we actually have to like educate them about hey these are some of the risks of drinking and these are some of the risk of any other type of drug if you want to engage in it engage in it responsibly be open about it tell me about it so you can have open ended conversations with your children and they don't feel like man if i drink i got to hide it from my parents it's going to be punitive punishment kind of like we were talking about earlier and and that comes from internally you know especially for people who really identify as sick who feel like yeah. sick values are a huge part of their life that we're a good body do all those kind of things it's like very hard to be like i'm doing something that's opposite to what my faith tells me telling my kid hey you know what it's actually okay to drink you know it's not bad i'm not it's not i'm not going to punish you for it i would rather you actually openly tell me about it so i know what behavior you're engaging with that you're not putting yourself in a risky situation that i know where you are you know that you don't have to hide it from me those are huge things that we need to get over in terms of our own personal stigma around those behaviors because oftentimes within six spaces we we do this we're like oh that person doesn't like people who drink and it's like oh i can't drink around that guy you know and then they're hiding it they go to somebody's house they're drinking in somebody's car you know and then they come into the place drunk because they wanted to drink as much as they could these kind of behaviors stem from our own personal like insecurities with alcohol and we got to get rid of them 
you know, because we have to have that compassion for other people and, and within our own family, especially if you have kids, like you have to get over that uh, fear, you know. I know we're, mm -hmm. I'm just going to really quickly add, I just, that's like such an amazing point, you know, like, um, the th two things I thought about as you're talking about is like harm reduction and how we have these conversations. And one big thing with like, when we think of harm reduction for me is like, it inherently has this, um, like you just said, like you need to get rid of your insecurity with alcohol to accept harm reduction. Like you need to get, you need to have acceptance that alcohol exists in people's lives. Like it may not just not be there. Um, and that's how you start looking at harm reduction as something that you actually implement and use in your life. And um, um, when they're talking about like radical acceptance sometimes that, you know, someone may not stop drinking um, and I need to be able to fit with that, be comfortable with that, accept that. And then I can start accepting that there are other things I can do, other ways to keep this person safe. And that's what harm reduction is all about. Right. So um, I just think that's like such an important thing that we've struggled in to keep uh, like through a sick perspective for a very, very long time with like our only goal is this person has to stop drinking because, you know, that's the sick value. That's what makes them good. Um, and until we can't, we can't sh accept that, you know what, like, yes, I can live my, my life with whatever sick value I may want, but everyone else has a choice to live their life with the values they want. And if drinking is a part of something we're going to do, let it, let us be safe about it and talk about it with acceptance. Um, rather than just shutting it down as a conversation we don't have because it's inherently bad. Um, and that goes with how we talk about youth and and that kind of really big internal struggle I think we often have with like our, our sick value and what we talk to our kids about and how we frame it for them. And I, you know, I can say like I would struggle with that too. And so we all just need to accept that. What is the healthy way and the safest way to have these conversations? So great point. Enjoy that. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I think what I'm gathering is that whether um, we like it or not, people are going to drink. Um, so how can we, yeah, how can we make safe spaces for them to do it in a healthy, in a health, well, not a healthy, but in a responsible way? Um, my closing, I know we only have two minutes, but um, my closing question, um, and it's a little bit of a selfish one because I'd love to, I'd love to know the answer. Um, but I'm wondering what drew you guys to this work uh, and what, what keeps you motivated? Maybe more so what keeps you motivated in doing this work? Let's just stick with that one because we have about two minutes left. Um, but Belinda, if you want to share what keeps you motivated in, in doing this work? You know, um, I, I think I just, just maybe like an inside passion. I don't know where that comes from. Uh, it's just something that's hard to, but uh, just like, you know, being able to help people and, uh, you know, when people, I mean, there's, I mean, it's not just that there's a lot of people that do change through this work too. There's a lot of people go on to live very healthy lives, very healthy marriages, you know, lifestyles. So I think that is my biggest motivator uh, to sort of, you know, to be in this group because it really makes a change. Yeah, I would echo that sentiment as well. I, I feel like there's just so much need within the community and we have so much access right now in terms of this generation that's coming up in terms of being creative, utilizing our resources and also having like open-mindedness, having experiences that are different. Our worldview is a little bit larger. Um, and so that motivates me to continue creating spaces for our community in that regard. I think like doing these kind of things is so valuable because not only do we get to engage with people, but we also get to find out other people within our own kind of framework that are like-minded and are doing similar type of work in different areas. So that kind of provides me with extra motivation to, to like continue that work, continue collaborating. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of like echo certain sentiments because I think for me, again, what motivates me is as soon as I look and I see like, hey, like I'm from my own community and like I've been given the opportunity to like have whatever education I have and like the knowledge I have. And I just want to get like, you know what I mean? Like it's like no one else is going to do this work and it's going to be us and it comes from us and we understand our communities the best. And so it really like what draws me to like, continue to do this work and be here. And conversations like today, like seeing how many of us are passionate and how many of us want to be in these spaces and improve our communities and allow people to live these better lives. Like, I think all of this is just what's so inspiring and um, makes you feel like it's possible. Like it's possible for us to continue to give back to our communities and have them improve. And um, 
yeah, I'm just, I'm thankful for today's conversation. It was definitely also one of those, like one of those examples of a time which really motivates you. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. I wonder, yeah, if anyone has anything else to share, if not, I'll close this out for today. Awesome. Yeah, I'm reflecting a little bit on um, the different knowledges that everyone has, both ourselves and our parents, um, and how we can maybe not create hierarchies of good and bad or better knowledge, um, but kind of meet in the middle and see different knowledges uh, as worthy of our time and space as well. Because I think sometimes we're like, we have the Western education, we know everything, um, but also meeting our parents where they're at and um, acknowledging their their knowledge, their experiences, and also seeing it as valid. Because I think a lot of what we think and know is actually building off of what they've taught us. Um, so I think sometimes we maybe flip it and we're like, no, this is what my psych degree taught me or what my like biology degree taught me. But there's also um, all of this that we bring that um, we didn't learn just from those like kind of institutional spaces. So I'm thinking about, yeah, different types of knowledges and honoring all of them. Um, as always, uh, on behalf of Sikri, I thank all of today's wonderful panelists for this insightful conversation. Um, again, as always, there will be a recording of this webinar available within 24 hours. Um, it will either be sent directly to your email or you can go to our YouTube page, uh, youtube.com slash um, to listen to the entire conversation if there's anything that you wanted to go back on. Um, and lastly, don't forget to tune into the SICCast, a podcast produced by SICRI, where we explore the various issues and events affecting six worldwide. Thank you for joining in. Today's webinar will be ending now. You are listening to SICCast by SICRI Research Institute, illuminating every path.